Welcome back to Invention Dimension. Today's episode is all about testing and learning more about your prototype and how it works. Once an inventor has built a prototype, testing is really important. Testing helps inventors make improvements where necessary and gain valuable feedback from actual testers and data collection. Inventors take the information from testing and decide if they need to go back and make changes to parts of their prototype. In this step, you will test your hypothesis. Remember, your hypothesis is what you thought would happen or how it might work when you were seeking solutions. This is your chance to see if you were right and if it works. Take your prototype out to people who would use it if it were on the market. Create a survey and gather feedback from your testers. Keep track of all of this as it is your data and it will be useful to display and share later. Being an inventor can be hard work and most times your first prototype is not successful. Inventors don't give up or see the process as failure. They are collecting information about what didn't work to take into the next prototype or version. Inventor Thomas Edison said, I have not failed, I have just found a thousand ways that won't work. And inventor Henry Ford said this, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Now that's the right attitude. Today we will meet people who use testing every day to develop and create new solutions and prototypes. Come on, let's go and learn more. Even a large corporation like United Technologies does a tremendous amount of testing. Um, every product, every solution needs to be tested. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. United Technologies uses what we call a technology readiness level, and it allows a product to, or a technology to go through various stages. And typically after TR, you, know, so you start very low, there's usually a lot of failures in the lower TRL. So this, and it, this is a NASA um, technology readiness level activity. And so in the early stages, you're almost expected to fail. We want to be able to fail, to be able to grab that critical learning, to be able to apply that learning and then come to the next solution that's even more robust. As we evolve through the technology readiness level, and we usually start at two and we go all the way up to nine, which is actually a, a, a released product, um, we do, we experience a lot of failures. And when we hit TRL 6, we now say it's ready. So there's six opportunities to pass or fail within our product development process. The failure is worth, in a lot of cases, way more than the success. The problem with success is you stop, right? With failure, you keep going. Sometimes I experiment with different pieces that I can use in place of others uh -huh. to see if that will help. Like for mine, I kept on having this one piece that kept on coming out, so I tried, tried, to, tried to use a different screw for it, and it's working now. So scientists and inventors like myself often use software like Microsoft Excel to graph our data. We kind of started out with price point in mind. So um, there's a similar product on the market to this. It's a company out of Finland that makes it. Um, but the feedback that we, when we talked to people, we saw like, oh, somebody else is making this, but they charge $600 for it. So for a big event space, that's great, but we really wanted to focus on schools. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked with a lot of the teachers and said, okay, where's, where's kind of the top end of where you might be able to pay out of pocket for it, or it would be easy for you to get your school to pay for it. So we kind of started with a price point in mind and tried to build off of that. Um, so obviously that impacts you know, what components you use, how many, you, you may have this big list of features, cool things you want to do, but if you've got to hit the price point, then sometimes you have to scale those back scale out. Scale those aspects back. When Simone originally designed the product, it was for what's, what's known in the marketplace as typical children. And it was really the autism community that reached out to us right after we were on Kickstarter to say, we really think you have something here for us because there's really nothing in the marketplace for children with autism that helps them express their emotions. How Can we use your bear to do to do that as well. It's like, absolutely, you know, honestly, it's not a market that we thought of right away, but you, one thing you learn is you have to pivot pretty quickly as a small business. And you have a, you have a marketplace telling you they want your product, you find a way to make it happen. So we, we connected and now we're in 20 different states and, uh, with 
with kids and autism using the product, we were sending it to educators and they were testing the product. And we knew because it's only in happy, fat, uh, happy face and sad face patch today that there's gonna be some limitations, but we asked them to use it as is and help us understand how would we do things differently. So they've started reaching back out to us and we're in the process of working to figure out a line of patches for children uh, that, with autism that may more align with kind of the teaching methods or the cool down methods in school that happy and sad face patch today may or may not help them with. When our students were working for Airstream designing a new trailer, there was a testing process involved. Um, they started with a full-scale mock-up, we call these, uh, typically made from inexpensive materials that are, that are easily manipulated and changed. And in this case, it was mostly cardboard. We built a full-scale uh, space uh, to the size and dimensions of an Airstream trailer, had the students mock up the interior in cardboard, brought in a whole host of people to evaluate that, including the president of of Airstream, uh, Mr. Bob Wheeler, their head of marketing, their engineering team, and some test customers that gave the students critical feedback uh, based upon things like, you know, counter height and location and ease of traffic flow and can I reach uh, where the coffee is and, you know, where's the light switch going to go? All of these things become critical decisions that the students must make. They learn from that feedback process, go back to the drawing board, make some adjustments and changes, mock it up again in cardboard and kind of continue to repeat that process again and again until we get to what we hope is the best possible solution. We want them to test them against users most importantly. You know, how does the user perceive the project? Perception is oftentimes, you know, a make or break in, in deciding if this is a good viable solution or not. Um, obviously, you're also testing against manufacturing and capabilities and capacity. Um, and the client often has a, a voice in that process. But the important thing is we want them to test. We want them to make prototypes, go out into the marketplace, have people try those out, get feedback, come back to the studio, learn from that feedback, apply that new knowledge to solving the problem and move forward. And it's a fail fast and fail forward process. As you have learned in this episode from designers, scientists, and inventors, testing, redesigning, and summarizing your findings and data is a necessary step in arriving at a successful finished prototype. It could be fun to watch people test your prototype and see how an idea in your head has grown into a usable gadget or solution. Inventor and self-made billionaire, Sarah Blakely's dad used to ask her this question as a young girl. What have you failed at this week? She has shared, this helped her be much freer in life to try new things and truly achieve something new and different. You are on your way to being an inventor and sharing with the world something that you dreamed of you created and couldn't exist without you and your hard work.